and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Sorry if this week's episode is a few days late. Longtime listeners will recall that I do enjoy a bit of deer hunting and that it is deer season right now here in New York, so I've spent a bit of time in the woods and haven't been able to spend as much time on show prep as I normally like to. Things should settle down over the next few weeks. Anyway, let's get on with the show. Last episode, we talked about the opening phase of the Thirty Years' War. To recap, in 1618, due to religious differences, the Kingdom of Bohemia revolts against its king, Ferdinand II, who is also the Holy Roman Emperor. Ferdinand puts down the rebellion, but he owes a debt to Maximilian I, Duke of Bavaria, who had supplied most of his armies. Ferdinand decides to kill two birds with one stone and takes the opportunity to punish his enemy Frederick, the Elector Palatine, who had been the Bohemian rebel's choice for king. Ferdinand strips Frederick of his position as Elector and transfers his lands and title to Maximilian. This unilateral transfer of land from one noble to another provokes a broader Protestant rebellion in the southwestern part of the empire. With the Dutch and Spanish once again going to war with each other, this religious war in the Holy Roman Empire becomes yet another area where they can wage a proxy war. So Dutch and Spanish troops are heavily involved in the fighting, as is Dutch money. Ultimately, Frederick is forced into exile and the imperial diet votes along religious lines to transfer the title of Elector Palatine from the Protestant Frederick to the Catholic Maximilian. And so the war would have ended had it not been for the fact that Emperor Ferdinand once again owes his allies. See, where we left off, Ferdinand is starting to seize bishoprics that are in Protestant hands and give them to his Catholic friends. This is technically legal under the terms of the Peace of Augsburg, and in most cases we're not talking about a ton of territory. Mostly this gives Ferdinand's allies an opportunity to put a small number of troops in little clusters here and there throughout northern Germany, the most heavily Protestant part of the empire. That said, some of these bishoprics are quite large, and not all of their Protestant overlords are willing to give up control quietly. See, the Protestant statelets of northeastern Germany are grouped into small local alliances of mutual defense called the Upper Saxon Circle and the Lower Saxon Circle. An attack on one member of one of these circles is an attack on all. Kind of like miniature versions of NATO, you might say. Now, Christian of Brunswick, a member of the Lower Saxon Circle, raises an army to defend the bishopric of Halberstadt, which is a bishopric he has been in charge of previously, which Ferdinand wants to take away and give to a Catholic member of the empire. And Uh, Christian of Brunswick asks the other members of the Lower Saxon Circle to assist him, but they don't. And Christian's army of 20,000 raw recruits is forced to retreat to friendlier territory in the Protestant Netherlands. He is pursued by the dogged General Tilly, the leader of the troops for the Catholic League, a formal alliance of Catholic states in the empire, and Tilly ends up catching up with him just a few miles from the Dutch frontier. In the battle that follows, 14,000 of Christian soldiers are killed or captured. Only 6,000 make it safely to the Netherlands. Recognizing that he messed up and acted prematurely, Christian of Brunswick voluntarily resigns as administrator of the bishopric of Halberstadt, temporarily avoiding a war. But this spread of conflict to a new part of the empire draws in different outside powers. 
if you've listened to the last episode, which you probably should if you want to follow this one in its entirety, uh, you'll remember that we've had the Spanish involved so far because of their Habsburg family alliances uh, with the Austrian Habsburg branch of the family. And the Spanish also need to control the Spanish road, the territories between the Spanish lands in northern Italy and the Spanish territory in the Netherlands. We have had the Dutch involved, right, because of their conflict with the Spanish. We've had the English involved because of their own royal family connections and because of their on-again, off-again alliance with the Dutch. And it's also worth mentioning that France is getting involved and despite being a Catholic power, is acting on the Protestant side. But That's another can of worms, and we'll talk about France in the next episode. Here in northern Germany, the main trading partners, the main outside powers who have an interest in the area, uh, they aren't along the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. Uh, Here, the commercially oriented Protestant states do most of their trade with the large Protestant Baltic nations of Sweden and Denmark-Norway. Denmark, Norway is a special case. We'll just call it Denmark from now on, but it consists of both Denmark and Norway. And the king of Denmark is a man named Christian IV. Christian IV is a Protestant, and in addition to being the king of Denmark, he also happens to be the Duke of Holstein. And Holstein is a member of the Lower Saxon Circle. So all of this drama in the area isn't just some overseas religious war from Christian IV's perspective. It affects his own land. Not only that, but one of his sons is the Bishop of Verdun and has been selected to be the next Archbishop of Bremen. These aren't just little estates like most bishoprics. These are important cities And Christian has some legitimate concern that Ferdinand is going to try to remove his son from his positions. Meanwhile, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden is another powerful Protestant king. He's just concluded a war against the Polish and currently controls some land in what we now call the Baltic States. As a neighbor to the empire, he does a lot of trade with the Protestant powers and is concerned about what might happen if Ferdinand forces the entire empire to become Catholic. In 1624, King James of England sends ambassadors to both Christian and Gustavus Adolphus, proposing to provide financial aid if they go to war against the emperor. Of the two, Gustavus Adolphus has the most ambitious plan. He wants to raise an army of 50,000 men to support the Protestant cause. But he wants England to pay for 17,000 of them, and he refuses to march until he's received four months' pay in advance. This sounds expensive, but Gustavus Adolphus is remembering what happened when Protestant General Ernst von Mansfeld was forced to live off the land in the Palatinate, if you remember from last episode, um, when this army was forced to live off the land, even the local Protestants, uh, who uh, supposedly would have been happy with their presence, well, they got sick of his troops looting and kicked them out. Even so, the British decide to go with Christian IV's plan, which is a little bit cheaper. The Danish king thinks he can succeed with an army of 30,000 men, with only 6,000 of them funded by the English. In March 1625, though, King James dies, and it takes a little while for things to get sorted out in the English government, and the new King Charles takes over and gets a look at this plan and goes to Parliament, and in May, uh, eventually he comes to an agreement with Christian IV and Parliament uh, to at least, uh, in principle, fund Christian's plan. Further negotiations take the rest of the year, but the Treaty of The Hague is signed in December of 1625. In it, 
the English and Dutch officially agree to finance the Danish intervention in the Thirty Years' War. Now, while all of this has been going on, Emperor Ferdinand has not been idle. Right? He knows he needs more troops than just the Catholic League troops under General Tilly. But he has no money to spare. Instead, he turns to an ambitious general named Albrecht von Wallenstein. Uh, von Wallenstein had been a cavalry commander during the Bohemian War, and had been rewarded with a fiefdom in northern Bohemia for his service. Ferdinand now offers him land in northern Germany if he will finance and lead another imperial army, and von Wallenstein agrees. This will cause further trouble. See, von Wallenstein is not what you would call an honorable general. Like von Mansfeld, he wants his troops to live off the land. Now, von Mansfeld did this because it was what he could afford, but von Wallenstein wants to do this on purpose, to impose fear on the local populace. In his book, The Thirty Years' War, 19th century British historian Samuel Rawson Gardner writes of von Wallenstein's history under Ferdinand. He says, quote, His parents were Lutheran. But when, at the age of twelve, he was left an orphan, he was placed under the care of an uncle who attempted to educate him in the strict school of the Bohemian Brotherhood, a body better known in later times under the name of Moravians, and distinguished as they are now for their severe moral training. The discipline of the brethren seems to have had much the same influence upon the young nobleman that the long sermons of the Scotch Presbyterians had upon Charles II. The boy found his way to the Jesuits at Olmutz and adopted their religion, so far as he adopted any religion at all. His real faith was in himself and in the revelations of astrology, that mystic science which told him how the bright rulers of the sky had marked him out for fame. For a young Catholic of ability without wealth, there was no room in Bohemia under the shadow of the great houses. With Ferdinand as yet ruler only of his three hereditary duchies, he found a soldier's welcome, and was not long in displaying a soldier's capacity for war. To Wallenstein, no path came amiss which led to fortune. A wealthy marriage made him the owner of large estates. When the revolution broke out, he was colonel of one of the regiments in the service of the estates of Moravia. The population and the soldiers were alike hostile to the emperor, Seizing the cash box of the estates, he rode off in spite of all opposition to Vienna. Ferdinand refused to accept booty acquired after the fashion of a highwayman and sent the money back to be used against himself. The Moravians said openly that Wallenstein was no gentleman, but the events which were hurrying on brought his name into prominence in connection with more legitimate warfare and he had become famous for many a deed of skill and daring before Frederick's banner sunk before the victors on the White Hill. Wallenstein was now in a position to profit by his master's victory. Ferdinand was not a man of business. In peace, as in war, he gladly left details to others, and there were good pickings to be had out of the ruin of the defeated aristocracy. Besides the lands which fell to Wallenstein's share as a reward for his merit, he contrived to purchase large estates at merely nominal prices. Before long, he was the richest landowner in Bohemia. He became Prince of Friedland. And now, when Ferdinand's difficulties were at their height, Wallenstein came forward offering to raise an army at his own cost. The emperor needed not to trouble himself about its pay, nor was it to be fed by mere casual plunder. Wherever it was cantoned, the general would raise contributions from the constituted authorities. Discipline would thus be maintained, and the evils upon which Mansfeld's projects had been wrecked would be easily avoided. Modern criticism has rejected the long-accredited story of Wallenstein's assertion at this time that he could find means to support an army of 50,000 men, but not an army of 20,000. It is certain that his original request was for only 20,000 but the idea was to occur to him sooner or later. Government by military force was the essence of his proposal, and for that purpose, the larger the number of his army, the better. 
The connection between two men whose characters differed so widely as those of Ferdinand and Wallenstein was from first to last of a nature to excite curiosity. Yet, after all, it was the only natural result of Ferdinand's own methods of government. The ruler who knows nothing beyond the duty of putting the law in execution, whilst he shuts his eyes to the real requirements of those for whom the law ought to have been made, must in the end have recourse to the sword to maintain him in his legality from destruction. The substitution of contributions for pillage may have seemed to Ferdinand a mode of having recourse to a legal, orderly way of making war. Unfortunately for him, it was not so. As the civil laws of the empire gave him no right to raise a penny for military purposes without the assent of the Diet, and as in the distracted condition of Germany the Diet was no longer available for the purpose, no one was likely to regard money so raised as legal in any sense at all. Ferdinand, in truth, had brought himself into a position from which he could neither advance nor retreat with honor. If he did not accept Wallenstein's services, he would almost certainly be beaten. If he did accept them, he would almost certainly raise a feeling in Germany which would provoke a still stronger opposition than that which he had for the present to deal with. Unquote. In fact, von Wallenstein is able to raise around 25,000 troops, and this is around the same size as the force that Tilly commands for the Catholic League, and it gives Ferdinand more political clout in the upcoming war. But as our historian Gardner pointed out, this way of raising troops and forcing the local people to support them will eventually backfire. And this expansion of the war, basically this doubling of the number of Catholic troops in the field, while temporarily effective, will eventually provoke further rebellion, as we'll see. Anyway, the campaign against the Danish begins in the spring of 1626. Christian IV moves into northern Germany and positions his main army of roughly 20,000 troops between the armies of Tilly and von Wallenstein. He wants to keep those forces from linking up and forming a combined Catholic army that would outnumber his men a little more than two to one. Von Wallenstein is off to his East, and he initially starts moving away to the east towards the city of Goslar, trying to bait Christian IV into making a move. But there are more Protestant troops in the area. See, there is a secondary army of some Scottish mercenaries, some Dutch mercenaries, and some of Christian IV's own troops. Uh, these Protestant troops are under the command of von Mansfeld, who you will remember from the last episode as one of the major Protestant commanders in the early phase of the war. Well, he's still around, and he is leading another army, this force, down from the north to attack the central German city of Magdeburg. Now, Magdeburg had just been captured by von Wallenstein over the winter, so von Wallenstein doesn't want to give this territory up, and he has to turn around and go back and fight off von Mansfeld. Now, von Mansfeld has the lead, but to get to Magdeburg, he has to cross the River Elbe, which means he has to march past the city to get to the nearest bridge, which is a little ways downstream at a place called Dessau. When he gets to the bridge, there is a small detachment of imperial troops, and there aren't a lot of them, but they have some cannons, and they're able to hold off von Mansfeld until the larger imperial force under von Wallenstein arrives to help on April 25th. Now, by this point, von Mansfeld's troops have been under heavy cannon fire for hours, whereas von Wallenstein's troops are relatively fresh, and they outnumber the Protestants around 20,000 to 12,000. The 
Imperial forces storm across the bridge and charge at the exhausted Protestant army, causing a disordered retreat and the capture of 4,000 men. At this point, von Mansfeld's Danish troops retreat back north while he leads his remaining German Protestants away to the west. Meanwhile, Christian IV and his main army remain at the fortress of Wolfenbüttel in the north. He's not feeling as aggressive as von Mansfeld and is instead using his presence to encourage more local Protestant princes to revolt. Tilly, the Catholic League commander, is slowly approaching him, taking one city after another on his way towards Christian. Eventually, Christian decides to take the field and attempts to cut Tilly off at the city of Northheim, but Tilly has already gotten there and plundered the city. And now Christian is caught in the open and he's forced to retreat back to his stronghold at Wolfenbüttel. And he could probably have made it back, but he refuses to abandon his army's baggage train, which is the slowest part of the army, and abandoning the baggage train would have increased their marching speed. But since he's moving so slowly, he is forced to stop on August 27th and form a defensive position because Tilly is almost on top of him. Christian has been following the course of the Niel River, a minor local river to the north. Before he stops, he gets his army across the Humaca stream, which feeds into the river. So you can kind of picture this stream feeding into the river. Well, now Christian is able to form up on the north side of the stream and anchor the right wing of his army on the river and face south. This means two things. First, uh, Tilly will have to cross the stream under fire to carry out any attack. Second, Tilly's men won't be able to get around Christian's right flank since the river is in the way. It's a strong defensive position, which bodes well for the Danish since Both of the forces are about equal at 20,000 men, and in general, when numbers are equal, the odds favor the defense. Those are just odds. They don't tell you the whole story, and Tilly is an experienced field commander. Tilly opens up the battle with an artillery barrage. The Danish respond, but... Their artillerymen are newly recruited and poorly trained. At any given time, only two of their 22 big guns are firing. Meanwhile, Tilly's more experienced Catholic League artillery is able to fire all 20 of their guns at once. This pounding... Uh, severely impacts Danish morale even before the battle is joined in earnest. Once the Danes have been softened up a little bit, Tilly orders his infantry to advance across the stream and attack the Danish center under cover of their own artillery fire. Now this in itself is a daring move. He's exposing his men to a vulnerable position, even under cover of their own artillery. They're still exposed to the Danish artillery, but then again, Danish artillery isn't doing much. And as daring as this charge is, all of this is actually a distraction. Remember that river blocking the Danish left flank? Well, Tilly has actually sent his cavalry across the river from a bridge on his side and way upstream to another bridge way behind the Danish, and they've gotten across that bridge and are now coming in and attacking Christian's right flank, those troops that were supposed to be safe by the river. And, by the way, that's where Christian has put his most unreliable troops, uh, the troops of his German allies, and uh, those are the ones most likely to run. More still, Christian himself is not even there to respond to this. See, 
he has gone off into some woods to deal with his baggage train, which has gotten stuck while trying to get all the way to the rear of his army. So he's not even commanding the main part of the battle. And his subcommanders are not sure what to do. He has not left them clear orders. And what seems to be in order here is a quick and rapid counterattack, but that doesn't happen. And instead, Tilly's troops quickly force them into a rout. They capture all of the Danish artillery, and they also capture over 3,000 Danish and Protestant German troops and kill nearly 4,000. So Christian has lost a little over a third of his army, and oh, in the retreat, Tilly even captures Christian's baggage train. So despite all of his obsession with his baggage, Christian has managed to lose even that. More importantly, though, Christian of Denmark has lost most of his support. See, King Charles of England has promised him uh, to pay for a good part of this army, right? Now, this money comes to 30,000 pounds a month that King Charles has agreed to pay, but so far Parliament has only approved 140,000 pounds. That's not even enough for five months. The war has already been on for eight, and no additional funding is in sight. Right, this makes it hard for Christian to replenish his supplies or replace his artillery, and he can't even subsidize his own German allies, who quickly melt away. So with no artillery and no allies... Christian is forced to retreat north to the city of Stad to make his winter quarters. But here his lack of money actually does him a favor. He is forced to let his troops live off the land, which means pillaging. And as much as we've talked about how this can be a really bad thing, in this case, uh, when his men strip the land bare of supplies... When Tilly tries to follow him and destroy the rest of the Danish army, uh, Tilly is forced to turn back for lack of food. There's nothing to supply his men. Meanwhile, the other Protestant commander, uh, von Mansfeld, has run all the way to Hungary with von Wallenstein hot on his heels. He hopes to join up with the Transylvanian Calvinist king Bethlen Gabor and bring the war to Hungary and the empire's far east. But just as Christian IV has been relying on his allies to help fund his armies, Bethlen Gabor has been waiting for help from an ally of his own, the Ottoman Empire. But just as the English haven't really been coming through for Christian IV, the Ottoman sultan uh, ultimately declines to join any war in alliance with Bethlen Gabor. So in the face of von Wallenstein's army, Bethlen Gabor makes peace, and von Mansfeld is forced to sell his artillery and disband his remaining troops. He tries to get back to Germany, or at least to England, by sea, but... On his way to catch a ship in Venice, he dies in late November 1626. With the total defeat of von Mansfeld's army, von Wallenstein is free to join up with Tilly in the north. The event that Christian IV had so feared, this union of the Catholic armies, has come to place. And... Both of these armies will spend the bulk of 1627 forcing Christian to beat a steady retreat back through Holstein and into Schleswig, which is the northernmost province of the empire. It is directly adjacent to Denmark. So not only is he losing now, but he's actually lost control of the Duchy of Holstein, which is one of the imperial territories he went to war over to begin with. This is not good, at least from the Protestant perspective. As a reward for his great service, 
Emperor Ferdinand gives von Wallenstein yet another bit of land. He gives him the title of Duke of Mecklenburg. Now, Mecklenburg is a powerful duchy on the Baltic coast, and this land adds greatly to von Wallenstein's growing power. Moreover, the land grant is controversial even among Catholic leaders, who are once again upset that Ferdinand is arbitrarily assigning land from one duke to another. And he's not supposed to do that. At least not without a vote in the imperial diet. It goes against the empire's tradition of home rule. Not only that, but it throws the balance of power within the empire out of whack. Previously, the imperial army, meaning the troops of the emperor himself... The imperial army has not been strong enough to single-handedly rule the empire. The Habsburg emperors have basically been the first among equals, for the most part. The most powerful leader in the empire, with the most powerful armies and the most wealth and the most manpower to draw on, but not enough to dominate. Up until now... Ferdinand has only held on to power because the princes of the Catholic League support him. All of those smaller Catholic powers put together make the difference. And now von Wallenstein commands an imperial army that seemingly cannot be opposed, and Unfortunately for Ferdinand, von Wallenstein is quickly becoming more powerful than even the emperor himself. In his book, A History of the Thirty Years' War, 18th century German historian and playwright Friedrich Schiller writes, quote, The exhaustion of the enemy made a speedy peace probable. Yet Wallenstein continued to augment the imperial armies until they were at least a hundred thousand men strong. Numberless commissions to colonelcies and inferior commands, the regal pomp of the commander-in-chief, immoderate largesse to his favorites, for he never gave less than a thousand florins, enormous sums lavished in corrupting the court at Vienna. All this had been effected without burdening the emperor. These immense sums were raised by the contributions levied from the lower German provinces, where no distinction was made between friend and foe and the territories of all princes were subjected to the same system of marching and quartering, of extortion and outrage. If credit is to be given to an extravagant contemporary statement, Wallenstein, during his seven years of command, had exacted not less than 60,000 millions of dollars from one half of Germany. The greater his extortions, the greater the rewards of his soldiers, and the greater the concourse to his standard for the world always follows fortune. His armies flourished while all the states through which they passed withered. What cared he for the detestation of the people and the complaints of princes? His army adored him, and the very enormity of his guilt enabled him to bid defiance to its consequences. It would be unjust to Ferdinand were we to lay all these irregularities to his charge. Had he foreseen that he was abandoning the German states to the mercy of his officer, he would have been sensible how dangerous to himself so absolute a general would prove. The closer the connection became between the army and the leader from whom flowed favor and fortune, the more the ties which united both to the emperor were relaxed. Everything, it is true, was done in the name of the latter. But... Wallenstein only availed himself of the supreme majesty of the emperor to crush the authority of other states. His object was to depress the princes of the empire, to destroy all gradation of rank between them and the emperor, and to elevate the power of the latter above all competition. If the emperor were absolute in Germany, who then would be equal to the man entrusted with the execution of his will? The height to which Wallenstein had raised the imperial authority astonished even the emperor himself. But as the greatness of the master was entirely the work of the servant, the creation of Wallenstein would necessarily sink again into nothing upon the withdrawal of its creative hand. Not without an object, therefore, did Wallenstein labor to poison the minds of the German princes against the emperor. 
The more violent their hatred of Ferdinand, the more indispensable to the emperor would become the man who alone could render their ill will powerless. His design unquestionably was that his sovereign should stand in fear of no one in all Germany besides himself, the source and engine of this despotic power. Wallenstein now began to assume the title of Generalissimo of the Emperor, by sea and land. Wismar was taken, and a firm footing gained on the Baltic. Ships were required from Poland and the Hans towns to carry the war to the other side of the Baltic, to pursue the Danes into the heart of their own country, and to compel them to a peace which might prepare the way to more important conquests the communication between the lower German states and the northern powers would be broken. Could the emperor place himself between them and encompass Germany from the Adriatic to the Sound, the intervening kingdom of Poland being already dependent on him, with an unbroken line of territory? If such was the emperor's plan, Wallenstein had a peculiar interest in its execution. These possessions on the Baltic should, he intended, form the first foundation of a power which had long been the object of his ambition, and which should enable him to throw off his dependence on the emperor. Unquote. As his next step in amassing power, von Wallenstein sets his eye on the city of Stralsund, an important seaport near his territory of Mecklenburg, but the city of Stralsund is independent and refuses to let him in. So he lays siege to the city in May of 1628. Stralsund is further protected by the fact that it's located on a thin stretch of land. There are three approaches to the city, but all are surrounded by water, and von Wallenstein's subordinate, Georg von Arnim, who is commanding this part of the siege, cannot get his artillery close enough to do damage. So instead, von Arnim lands some artillery on the island of Danholm, just outside the city in the Baltic and within artillery range. But he has no navy. He's used fishing ships to move this artillery, and the small Stralsund fleet is able to surround the island and force the artillery detachment to surrender. This attack of von Wallenstein on the city of Stralsund causes Christian IV and Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden to sign an agreement. Sweden and Denmark are not friends. As a matter of fact, they've been at war not all that long ago, but both of them are hoping to dominate the Baltic, and neither one wants von Wallenstein gaining his own foothold there, and maybe trying to break away from the emperor in the future and create his own Baltic kingdom. So, in mid-1628, both Scandinavian countries agree to assist the city of Stralsund. They have time to do this, in large part because von Wallenstein is only loosely besieging the city. He doesn't want to have to take it by force, that could even outrage Emperor Ferdinand and work against him. After all, this is a city that is loyal to the emperor within the empire. It's not some rebellious province. And within Stralsund itself, the upper classes mostly favor surrender. They want to get back to business. But the lower and middle classes, who would fare the worst during an occupation they overwhelmingly favor resistance, and so the city continues to resist. Eventually, von Wallenstein's patience wears thin, and while he is not yet personally present, he orders his subordinate, Georg von Arnim, to attack. But for a small city of 20,000, Stralsund is surprisingly well defended. In addition to 2,500 regular militia, the city has conscripted an additional 1,500 men and hired 1,000 mercenaries. So there are actually 5,000 people defending the city behind stout stone walls. Von Arnim launches a night assault on the eastern wall of the city, but the defenders are ready and push his forces back. After this failure, he launches two more assaults over the next three nights. And when 
Both of these assaults fail. He settles down and resumes his initial strategy of bombarding the city as best he can from a distance and waiting for von Wallenstein to arrive and take command. In the interim, help also arrives in Stralsund. Christian IV, who is slowly rebuilding his armies, well, he sends 900 men by sea, most of them Scottish mercenaries, and shortly thereafter, on June 20th, 600 Swedish troops arrive, dispatched by Gustavus Adolphus. This officially marks the beginning of Sweden's intervention in the Thirty Years' War, and yet another Protestant power fighting against the hated Habsburg dynasty. A week later, on June 27th, von Wallenstein finally joins his army and takes command over from von Arnim. Over the coming days, he launches a withering series of assaults. The most vulnerable part of the defenses is the Eastern Wall, which has been damaged by the artillery bombardment. This area is defended by a large contingent of Scots under their famous leader Robert Munro. In the fighting... 500 of the 900 Scots would be killed and more than 300 wounded, including Munro himself, but the wall would hold. Overnight, on the next night, June 28th, von Wallenstein succeeds in taking control of the outer defenses, but still cannot get into the city. Meanwhile, a thousand more Swedes arrive by sea on June 30th, and von Wallenstein once again settles into an artillery bombardment. This goes on for another two and a half weeks, and on July 17th, an additional 1,100 Scots arrive under the pay of Christian IV and under the command of a commander named John Leslie, and not content to stay on the defensive, Leslie immediately has his men sally out on a charge from the Western Wall, taking the Imperial forces by surprise, killing hundreds, and driving the enemy back from the city. And over the next two weeks, heavy rain would fall almost constantly, and this would turn the ground around Stralsund into a miserable swamp. Now for the defenders, this means getting wet while you're on watch duty and going inside to dry out when you're not. But for the attackers, it means making camp in knee-deep mud. It becomes impossible to dig sanitary latrines and filth spreads throughout the Imperial camp. Finally, on August 4th, von Wallenstein realizes that his position is untenable, and he's forced to abandon the siege. Now, the Battle of Stralsund might only have been over one small city, but it marks a turning point in the war. First, von Wallenstein, the invincible imperial leader with his huge army, has been beaten in the field for the first time. Second, Sweden has been brought into the war, dashing Wallenstein's hopes of building his Baltic kingdom. Meanwhile, as I said, Christian IV of Denmark has slowly been rebuilding his own army, and he sails to the island of Ustum, to the east of Stralsund, and launches an attack on the imperial city of Volgast, taking it without a fight on August 11th, even as von Wallenstein's army is stuck in the mud outside Stralsund. With popular support, Christian IV turns Volgast into another fortress city like Stralsund. The people there are overwhelmingly Protestant, they're okay with this, and Christian's hope is to bait von Wallenstein into another siege. But by this point, von Wallenstein's main field army has been denuded by his uh, siege at Stralsund. He's lost 12,000 men. He only has 7,000 left to march against Volgast. And Christian IV, meanwhile, has managed to raise 6,000 troops. So th the forces are about equal, and if he can force von Wallenstein into a siege, that's going to actually favor him. But for whatever reason, Christian decides not to wait for a siege after all, but to march out and meet von Wallenstein's army in the field. 
And just as happened before, the last time he tangled with von Wallenstein, his troops are mostly fresh and less experienced. And while his Scottish mercenaries fight well, these Scots just keep turning up everywhere, don't they? Uh, von Wallenstein's cavalry quickly overwhelm and rout the Danish right flank, killing 1,500 men and capturing 600. Christian retreats from the field and his army flees by sea overnight, leaving the city of Volgas to the Imperials. And as is his strategy, von Wallenstein proceeds to plunder and loot the city. But despite his victory here, von Wallenstein knows that he can't keep fighting both the Danes and the Swedes. He has to whittle down his number of enemies to something more manageable. So, without Emperor Ferdinand's permission, he makes peace with Christian IV in spring 1629. In the peace treaty, Christian agrees not to go to war with the emperor again. And in return, he receives back all the territory he had lost in the war, including the Duchy of Holstein. This is a surprisingly generous peace deal, but it makes sense when you remember how badly von Wallenstein needs Denmark to get out of the war, even if it means giving up a little bit. In the wake of this treaty, in March 1629, Emperor Ferdinand again has a chance to make peace, as he does a few times during this war, and as he seems to do every time, he instead overreaches. He signs a document called the Edict of Restitution. This is a formal imperial edict ordering that all church lands in the entire Holy Roman Empire be returned to Catholic hands. This is a much larger and more official version of his earlier seizure of church lands, which was limited in scope. And this action is also even more controversial. In addition to the archbishoprics of Bremen and Magdeburg, there are 12 large, regular bishoprics involved and more than 100 smaller estates and buildings. When you look at where all of these bishoprics are, this is going to change the borders of pretty much every Protestant state in Germany, like particularly those of the Calvinists, who now have no rights whatsoever. And... Once again, even many Catholic members of the empire object because this kind of thing is supposed to happen by a vote of the imperial diet. Right? Instead, the edict of restitution is an edict. It's the emperor's sole decree. While there's a little bit of grumbling, the Catholic states still don't really do anything to stop Ferdinand II's abuses. Von Wallenstein sweeps through the provinces virtually unopposed, his army snowballing to more than 100,000 men and swarming like locusts across the land. They pillage anything that isn't nailed down, and without the King of Denmark to defend them, the German Protestants are once again on the ropes. But they have a new champion, Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. Let's back up a little bit and talk about this guy, because he's important. Gustavus Adolphus was born on December 15, 1594, the nephew of the former Swedish king John III, who had died in 1592. Now, John had left his kingdom to his son, Gustavus Adolphus's cousin, uh, Sigismund, who was already the king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. However, this led to unrest in Sweden, since Sweden was already a heavily Protestant country while Sigismund was a devout Catholic. Sigismund's uncle Charles, Gustavus' Adolphus' father, was acting as regent of Sweden and Finland while Sigismund ruled from Warsaw. And when Sigismund made moves to integrate Sweden, Finland, and the Commonwealth into a single realm, Charles would drag his feet ignore orders, and 
outright rule Sweden and Finland as if they were his own country. In 1598, Sigismund has had enough of this, and so he convinced the Commonwealth's Parliament to authorize funds for an army, and he invaded Sweden. In September of that year, he would be defeated at the Battle of Stanjbro and personally captured. He would be forced to return to Poland, and the Riksdag of the Swedish estates would soon declare Charles as king, making Gustavus Adolphus his official heir. Charles spent most of his reign at war, fighting to maintain Swedish independence from Russia, Denmark, and Poland. Gustavus Adolphus, meanwhile, grew up learning the art of war, and when his father died in 1611, he became king in his own right. When Gustavus took the throne, Sweden was in the middle of a war with Russia. A true warrior king, he took the field and led his armies deep into Russian territory. The following quote is from an American diplomat named John Levitt Stevens, who is best known for his role in the annexation of Hawaii, but also served as a resident U.S. minister to Sweden in the late 1800s. Here is what Levitt Stevens had to say about Gustavus's war with Russia, which he inherited from his father. He says, quote, Gustavus proceeded to push military operations with as much vigor as possible, leading the campaigns in person. He kept open the Baltic for his ships. Finland was near from which to draw supplies and soldiers, and the hostile relations of Poland to Russia tended to strengthen the Swedish arms, though the Polish king was a rival of Gustavus for the Swedish throne. Though unable to make war outside of their own territory, and because of their demoralization unfit to push properly organized campaigns, the Russian soldiers defended fortresses and towns when attacked with a dogged pertinacity and endurance. In that regard, the young Gustavus found them to possess those qualities against which Frederick the Great of Prussia discovered to be formidable 150 years later, and against which Napoleon struck with fatal consequences at the summit of his power in 1812. For four years more, the war between those two countries continued, in which the young Swedish monarch was acquiring discipline and valuable experience for the great work to which he was to be called in his subsequent career. The advantage being generally on the side of the Swedes, though they were not always successful in important sieges. The English and the Dutch governments sought earnestly and persistently to bring about peace between the belligerents. Finally, through the mediation of the English agents, negotiations were renewed with success. Gustavus remaining unshaken in his demands and securing terms advantageous to the Swedes. The war had continued ten years, and the treaty was signed February 1617. Russia yielded to Sweden a large breadth of territory, shutting herself out from the Baltic. The land where St. Petersburg now stands becoming Swedish territory. On the frontiers, they raised a monumental stone with the crowns of Sweden and this inscription. Here Gustavus Adolphus, king of Sweden, establishes the frontiers of his kingdom. May it please God that they shall always thus remain. Unquote. As you might have guessed, the ground where St. Petersburg now stands would not always be Swedish. It would be reconquered by Tsar Peter the Great in 1703, and there he would build the city that bears his name. But in the course of his Russian conquests, Gustavus Adolphus had learned some valuable lessons, and he would make some changes to the Swedish military before he got involved in the Thirty Years' War. The first thing he would address would be the method of raising an army. Remember, we're in the late Renaissance era and European warfare is changing. Throughout the Middle Ages, European countries were, broadly speaking, too poor to support standing armies like the old Roman legions. Instead, the only quote-unquote standing armies were the knights, who supported themselves from their lands. Wealthier knights might have a few retainers, 
A duke might have some guards at his castle, and a king might have one or two hundred men in a royal guard, but that's it. If you needed more men, which you often did, you were pressing peasants into service. Now, throughout this period, different countries have found different ways of dealing with this. For example, in the late medieval era, it was the law in England that all able-bodied men must practice with their longbows after church on Sundays. So, instead of just handing their peasants a bunch of spears, which, by the way, is uh, a surprisingly viable strategy, uh, instead of doing that, the English were able to turn them into something more useful, the famed English longbowmen. And now in the early 1600s, muskets have transformed how armies battle it out, and they've made it possible for any raw conscript to contribute to battle. You think about those longbowmen, it takes a lot of time, a lot of practice to get really good with a bow. Few weeks of drilling, and you can turn just about anybody into a halfway competent musketman. And knights have lost most of their military usefulness. They've been replaced by faster-moving light cavalry and mixed infantry formations of pikes and muskets. And countries have found ways to deal with that. For example, the Spanish and Dutch are rich enough to pay huge numbers of mercenaries. Von Wallenstein has just been press-ganging people into service for the Empire, and well, things seem to be going okay for him. And Gustavus Adolphus, well he decides to use the power of religion. See, Sweden's population is almost entirely Protestant, and the society is very pious. So, Gustavus orders all churches in his kingdom to keep a record of all able-bodied male parishioners aged 16 to 60. This does a couple of things. First, it gives the king a pool of men to draw from for his armies. It gives him a permanent standing army of 20,000 men with many more in reserve. But secondly, it turns military service into a religious duty. Gustavus's new infantry, appropriately known as the Gustavian infantry, aren't just fighting for money or because they were forced to. They're Renaissance Protestant crusaders on a mission for God and King. As a side note, they also form the basis for the later Carolean infantry, one of history's most feared armies. And I did a whole episode on my Patreon channel about those infantry for Patreon subscribers only. You can find a link in the episode description if you want to subscribe, but enough with shameless self-promotion. See, Gustavus Adolphus doesn't just modernize the Swedish infantry. He also recognizes the value of artillery, especially for a less populous country like Sweden that will be fielding fewer men than, say, von Wallenstein's massive army. Artillery of the day are made from cast iron or bronze, and they're extremely heavy. They take hours to get into position and ready to fire. So once you've got your artillery set up at the start of a battle, that's pretty much it. If you end up needing your big guns somewhere else on the field, you won't be able to move them in time to make a difference. And as a result, these late Renaissance cannons are only useful as offensive weapons if you're attacking a fixed defensive position, like a city wall. Right, the enemy can't move out of the way, you can get your guns in place and shoot. In an open battle, your artillery can deter an enemy from attacking one part of your line, but that's about it. Unless your enemy literally marches into cannon fire, there's not much you can do. So Gustavus Adolphus commissions his engineers to build a lightweight cannon that can easily be moved around the field during a battle. The original design is a so-called leather cannon, which is made with layers of leather and tightly coiled rope. 
These guns are very light indeed and make fearsome offensive weapons, but they also have a fatal flaw. See, they tend to explode when they get hot, which kills or maims the gun crew. Oops. So the engineers eventually come up with a better solution. Smaller, more mobile versions of the existing large cast iron and bronze guns. But these can be pulled by a three-man team or even by a single horse if you're in a hurry. Now, th on the downside, they, they have a much smaller bore. The load is only three pounds, so they don't hit as hard as the bigger guns. But what the Swedish artillerymen can do is redeploy in the middle of a battle as needed. Right. Smaller guns where you need them are better than bigger guns sitting idle. That is what Gustavus and his engineers are thinking here. And to make the most out of these newer, lighter guns, Gustavus actually changes the way his army is organized. See, at this time, in most armies, the artillery acts as a separate entity. Right? It reports directly to the senior field commander. It has its own orders, and it doesn't take orders from infantry or cavalry commanders in the immediate area. So if those commanders were to see an opportunity for the artillery to exploit, well, they can't give any orders. The artillery has to get those orders from the main commander. What Gustavus Adolphus does is he gives each of his regiments their own artillery with direct commands over their own guns. And with that command, the Swedish regimental commanders are able to quickly respond to conditions on the battlefield. Right? These fast guns don't have to wait for word from on high to go do something. Their local commander will have them do it really fast. All of this to say that by the time the Swedish army enters the Thirty Years' War in earnest, it's led by one of history's most innovative military commanders, and it's using new tactics that the Catholic armies have never seen. Von Wallenstein's Catholic army, despite its imposing numbers, is less well-disciplined and does not fight as cohesively in the field. Gustavus Adolphus is also able to bring his army to bear in 1630, which he wasn't able to do in 1629. During the Battle of Stralsund, if you remember, he only sent a couple of thousand guys, and that's because most of his army was busy in Poland. But in 1629, even as the Danish and the Holy Roman Empire make peace, so do Sweden and Poland. The peace is brokered by Cardinal Richelieu, first minister to the King of France, and a major player in this war that we haven't talked about yet. And we won't be talking about him again until the next episode. But he's there, he's active, and he is helping Gustavus Adolphus out with diplomacy and money. Anyway, while Gustavus Adolphus is free to act in 1629... It takes him a year to get his army ready to intervene, and he makes a landing at Penelmund, Pomerania, on July 4th, 1630, at the head of 13,000 troops. Now, Gustavus Adolphus has landed in this particular place for a reason. Pomerania is a Protestant duchy, and imperial troops are occupying some of its land in besieging the capital city of Stettin. Gustavus rushes to the city to drive away the imperial forces, but the Duke of Pomerania doesn't trust him any more than he trusts Emperor Ferdinand, and it first refuses to let Gustavus Adolphus into the city. 
Eventually, Gustavus does manage to negotiate his way inside, and as soon as he does, he occupies Stettin and forces the duke to sign a treaty that all but absorbs the Duchy of Pomerania into Swedish territory. He may be interested in removing the yoke of Catholic rule from his Protestant brothers, but he's also going to take some land and grow his kingdom while he does it. But even so, the arrival of any serious Protestant military force does light a fire in the devout people in the region, and over the next few months, around 10,000 local Protestants join Gustavus Adolphus's army. They see him as a champion of their faith, and perhaps more importantly, more than 12 years of war have wreaked havoc on the German economy, and the Swedish army pays its men on time. Simultaneously, even as Swedish power is growing in northern Germany, the Holy Roman Empire is bogged down by politics. Duke Maximilian of Bavaria, the political leader of the Catholic League, fears von Wallenstein's growing power. And he manages to convince Ferdinand that von Wallenstein is so powerful that he might take the imperial throne for himself. So Emperor Ferdinand fires von Wallenstein in September 1630 and disbands much of his army. Remember, most of the imperial army is recruited and paid for by Wallenstein, so when he gets fired, there goes much of the imperial army, and Meanwhile, the bulk of remaining imperial troops, most of them have been sent into northern Italy. That's a whole nother theater of the war uh, that we haven't even gotten into yet, and honestly probably won't, but there's also a war going on in northern Italy where the empire has gotten sucked in, and what this means, ultimately, with, with the disappearance of the imperial army, basically, is that the empire's defense is once again in the hands of the Catholic League army, under the political leadership of Maximilian of Bavaria and the military leadership of General Tilly. Gustavus Adolphus begins to move. He is going to take advantage of this moment of imperial weakness, and during the winter, he and Tilly play a game of cat and mouse across much of northern Germany. Their maneuvering is complicated, and it's a lot to go into, so suffice it to say that most imperial princes and dukes are remaining neutral still, and neither side wants to violate neutral territory. Remember how many times already in this war occupations and looting have backfired, and you can understand why neither Gustavus Adolphus nor Tilly would want to risk trespassing on neutral ground. Make those people angry enough, and they might join the war on the other side. Regardless, because the empire is so fragmented, because all of these territories have irregular borders and they're all crammed together haphazardly, uh, the armies have to do a lot of marching around and travel in wide, crazy loops to cross relatively short distances without crossing through neutral land. And Gustavus Adolphus is famous during this time for not being afraid to engage in war in the winter. Most armies in this era stopped campaigning for the winter when it was harder to march and resupply, but... Gustavus participates in several minor battles and even personally leads his troop in a daring Christmas Day raid on an unsuspecting imperial-held castle. And it's for these and other winter battles that Gustavus Adolphus would earn his historical epithet, Lion of the North. Gustavus then continues south to Frankfurt in early spring of 1631, and he takes the city in April after a short siege. 
He then goes on to take the nearby fortress of Landsberg. Now, Frankfurt and Landsberg are both powerful positions, and they sit between Austria and Swedish-held Pomerania. By taking these positions, Gustavus has now secured a large swath of majority Protestant territory, and he's blocked Ferdinand from moving in armies directly from the south. Meanwhile, Tilly hasn't just been sitting around twiddling his thumbs, but he hasn't been taking the fight to Gustavus Adolphus either. See, he has been active in the east. He has just sacked the city of Magdeburg, an important Swedish ally and Protestant power in the empire. During this sack, Tilly's troops massacre over 20,000 inhabitants. So both... The Swedish and the Catholic League have now taken a major city that the other side wants back. Gustavus and Tilly now march towards each other. But both armies come to a halt on opposite sides of the neutral duchy of Saxony. Despite being a Protestant, Duke John George of Saxony has so far managed to remain neutral. Not only that, but... He is the leader of the Upper Saxon Circle, a self-defense league similar to the Lower Saxon Circle, and the Upper Saxon Circle has so far remained out of the war. But after weeks of negotiations, without a breakthrough, Tilly screws up. He violates the border, and he marches his army through neutral Saxony, making a drive right for Gustavus Adolphus. And this turns out to be a huge mistake. It brings Saxony into the war on the Swedish side. Tilly and Gustavus Adolphus finally meet in the field on September 7, 1631, at the village of Breitenfeld. The joint Swedish Saxon force numbers around 42,000, with almost 18,000 of those troops being brand-new Saxon troops. As a result, the Protestant forces outnumber Tilly's Catholic army of 35,000 men. This would not be the case had Tilly not violated Saxon neutrality. Anyway, Gustavus Adolphus positions most of his cavalry on his right flank. With his Swedish infantry in the middle followed by a smaller number of Swedish cavalry, and the fresh Saxon troops are all the way out on the left. Tilly lines up with his infantry in the center and his cavalry on both flanks. Pretty classic deployment. Both armies have their artillery out to the front. The battle commences around noon with both sides letting loose those big guns in an artillery barrage. The Swedish guns quickly prove their worth, firing their smaller cannonballs an average of three to five times as quickly as the Catholic League gunners. But the Catholic guns are uphill, which gives them better range and visibility. Furthermore, the artillery is kicking up a ton of dirt and dust, and the Swedes are downwind, so all of this dirt is blinding them. Here, Gustavus Adolphus takes advantage of his more mobile army. He shimmies the entire army to one side while pivoting to remain facing the enemy. This maneuver keeps him from being directly downwind of Tilly, but it also threatens Tilly's flank. So to stop this and keep the Swedish pinned down, Tilly orders his cavalry to attack both of their flanks. His cavalry charge forward, but the Swedish have mixed a few clusters of musketmen in with their cavalry, so instead of launching a countercharge, the Swedish cavalry sit back, wait for their musketmen to fire on the enemy at point-blank range, and then charge in to drive the Catholic League cavalry back. This tactic is highly effective, and... While the Catholic League cavalry attack again and again, six or seven times, depending on your source, 
eventually they are forced to disengage from the Swedish cavalry. But some of the Saxon cavalry, right, the ones way out on the Swedish left, they aren't deployed in the same way, and they don't have close support from musketeers, and they run away in panic. And when the Saxon troops, the infantry, uh, see this, a bunch of them start running away until he takes advantage. And he orders his own infantry forward and to the right. They're all, uh, except for a few of them, just going to smash directly into the fleeing Saxons. And they're going to take that position and take the Saxon artillery, and they'll be able to wrap around the Swedish infantry from both the front and the rear, completely enveloping them. If Tilly's able to pull this off, this is going to be really bad news for Gustavus's troops. But once again, the Swedes take advantage of their superior mobility. They deploy their second line of infantry over to the left side to form a new line behind where the Saxons had retreated. And at the same time, Gustavus Adolphus has personally led his cavalry uh, on the right flank, right? He's led them in a charge against the imperial left, driving those troops from the field. And then he has continued over to the center of where the imperial line started. Remember those old cannons that the Catholic League troops are using still? Not very mobile, so when Tilly went out and charged that Saxon position, he left his artillery uh, with uh, basically the gun crews and uh, a few guys with muskets to protect them, but not enough, and Gustavus is able to capture those guns. And then he has them fire on the pinned-down Catholic troops who are now receiving fire not just from the Swedish artillery, but also from their own guns. Returning again to the book by John Levitt Stevens, quote, The imperialists were now in disorder, and the only course left was retreat, and this could be effected only through the midst of their enemies. In despair and anger, Tilly was almost beside himself when he saw victory torn from him. His famous dapple-gray old horse was slain, and on another he wished to lead his troops again to the fiery storm, but they would no longer obey him. He prayed, menaced, and wept with anger, but in vain. His troops fled into the plains, and the old general was compelled to follow them. Protected by dust and smoke, Several thousands of the oldest Imperial Infantry regiments closed up solidly their ranks, cut their way through the Swedish lines, and gained a small thicket, where they opposed a new front to their enemies. They were resolved not to lose the glory which had cost them so dearly. Gustavus Adolphus, with his cavalry of the Swedish left, attacked them. They fought with the greatest obstinacy, and would neither give nor take quarter. They maintained their resistance until their number was reduced to 600, and night came to their protection. When they retired on the Leipzig Road, with them disappeared from the field the last remnant of the imperial army, so arrogant and defiant in the morning. The armies of the emperor and the Saxon elector had to endure the common shame of defeat, and to Gustavus and his troops, little more than one-fourth of the whole number engaged, fell the glory of victory. The battle won, amid the dead and wounded, Gustavus fell upon his knees, and offered to heaven in fervent prayer his joyful gratitude for victory. He ordered his cavalry to pursue the beaten imperialists until the darkness of night should no longer permit. With the remainder of his army, he encamped between the field of battle and Leipzig. The next morning, Having received reliable information of the complete dispersion of the imperialists, he allowed his troops to pillage the camp and pursue the enemy. To preserve as much order as possible, the camp was divided into portions, and each regiment had its own. The booty was composed of a large quantity of gold, silver, precious objects, rich clothing, horses, and tents. Not a hand remained empty and a large number found in this pillage the wherewith to shelter them against need for life. 6,300 of the enemy were slain on the field, 
and 5,000 were wounded or prisoners. The whole artillery, the camp, and more than a hundred flags and standards of the imperialists fell into the hands of the victors. The Saxons lost nearly 2,000, and the Swedes 700. Unquote. And in the aftermath of the Battle of Breitenfeld, Gustavus Adolphus's reputation soars. Previously neutral Protestant powers like Hanover and Brandenburg, Prussia, flock to his cause, growing the Protestant armies even as the Imperials are scrambling. Always happy to invest in a winning cause, the English increase their subsidies, allowing Gustavus to keep on paying his larger army. Gustavus Adolphus spends the winter of 1631 to 1632 gathering strength and letting his German allies sit at home in their winter quarters. But in March of 1632, he goes on the march again, this time launching an invasion of Bavaria. Bavaria is the region in the southeast of Germany, just across the border from the imperial homeland in Austria. Bavaria is also one of the wealthiest powers in the Catholic League. Gustavus hopes to remove them from the war quickly, to weaken Emperor Ferdinand's finances. Not only that, but holding Bavaria would put the Swedes in a position to take the fight to the walls of Vienna itself. But to get into Bavaria, Gustavus must first get across the River Lech, which is defended by a newly reconstituted imperial army under the command of none other than General Tilly. On April 15, 1632, Gustavus forces a crossing of the river, and he once again uses his mobile artillery. By continually moving his guns to the front of the fight, he's able to cover his infantry as they make the crossing. Then once they're across, he can quickly move his cannons in to pound the imperial lines while the infantry charge in for the kill. It is during this critical phase of the battle that Tilly is shot in the thigh and is evacuated from the field. And the loss of such a distinguished commander cripples his troops' morale, and the imperial army retreats in panic. His leg wound would soon become infected, and Johann Tseracles, Count of Tilly, would die two weeks later at the age of 73. Gustavus Adolphus now leads his army through Bavaria virtually unopposed. His troops conduct a scorched-earth strategy, burning everything they can get their hands on. Only a few of the larger cities, such as Munich and Nuremberg, are spared. Instead, these wealthier cities are forced to pay a steep ransom in lieu of being pillaged. And at the same time, Duke John George's army is doing much the same thing in Bohemia. Bohemia is one of Emperor Ferdinand II's personal kingdoms, and the Saxon duke is running wild in the countryside, destroying and taking whatever he can. And with General Tilly dead, a desperate Emperor Ferdinand now turns to the only man with the power to defeat Gustavus Adolphus, our old friend Albrecht von Wallenstein. Wallenstein quickly raises a new army. He recalls many of his old officers who had resigned when the emperor had fired him, and he institutes many of the organizational changes Gustavus Adolphus had made in his own armies. Now, once again outnumbered, the Swedish king stops pillaging the countryside and retreats to the safety of the Bavarian city of Nuremberg. Von Wallenstein lays siege to the city, and during a three-month period, nearly half of Gustavus's troops die due to uh, malnourishment and disease, and he's eventually forced to withdraw into Saxony to back up. For much of the rest of 1632, 
the Imperial and Swedish armies engage in yet another game of cat and mouse, but neither side is able to force a decisive battle on their terms. By November, the Imperial army is preparing to go into winter quarters, but Gustavus Adolphus is eager to settle things once and for all. Desperate to catch up with von Wallenstein, he leads a dogged pursuit, and knowing that von Wallenstein is moving towards the village of Lutzen, Gustavus engages in a forced march and eventually catches up. On the afternoon of November 15, 1632, Gustavus catches up to the Imperial rearguard, which is occupying a lightly defended outpost about two and a half miles outside of Lutzen. Now, at this time, they engage in some skirmishing, and while the rearguard is easily defeated, they delay the Swedish enough for von Wallenstein to make preparations. And so... Night falls without the two main armies coming into contact. And the Swedish army sets up camp about a mile outside the village. And both sides settle in for a night of uneasy sleep. The morning of November 16, 1632, the battlefield is blanketed with a dense fog which makes it hard for both armies to see. The Swedish outnumber the Imperials around 18,000 to 15,000, so not by all that much. And without visibility, a long-distance artillery duel is futile. So, at the outset of the battle, Gustavus Adolphus tries to take the initiative right away and he leads his cavalry in a charge against the imperial left flank. They are successful at first. They clear out the front ranks of infantry, and they force them back, and they start to uh, almost uh, lose enough morale that uh, the imperial forces in this area are just going to run away. But as it seems that the imperials are about to break, around noon, Gottfried... Pappenheim, an Imperial cavalry commander, arrives with over 2,000 troops, which nearly evens the numbers, and he immediately sees the danger, and he leads a charge directly against Gustavus Adolphus and his cavalry and forces them back. And in the process, more than half the men on both sides in that cavalry engagement are killed or wounded, including Pappenheim, who is killed by a cannonball. Even as Pappenheim arrived, von Wallenstein had launched his own infantry in a furious attack on the Swedish center and left. And even as uh, von Wallenstein's own left has now corrected itself, Gustavus's army is in danger of collapsing. Let's return once more to Levitt Stevens, who says, quote, As soon as the king had received the intelligence of the recoil of his infantry at the center, and also that his left wing, under the sweeping fire of the imperial battery at the windmills, was showing signs of yielding ground, he gave the command of the Swedish right to Stolhansky, and with the Stenbach regiment of cavalry, hastened to lead back his troops to the attack. Arriving at the wavering center, he cried to his troops, "'Follow me, my brave boys!' and his horse at a bound tore him across the ditch. Only a few of his cavaliers followed him, their steeds not being equal to his. Owing to his impetuosity, perhaps also to his nearsightedness and the increasing fog, he did not perceive to what extent he was in advance, and became separated from the troops he was so bravely leading. He had remarked to those near him, as he rode with the rapidity of lightning to the assault, There in front of us is our most dangerous enemy, indicating the armored regiments of Piccolomini. An imperial corporal, noticing the Swedes made way for an advancing cavalier, pointed him out to a musketeer, saying he must be a personage of high rank, and urged him to fire on him. The musketeer took aim. His ball broke the left arm of the king, causing the bone to protrude and the blood to run freely. 
The king bleeds, cried the Swedes near him. It is nothing. March forward, my boys, responded the wounded hero, seeking to calm their inquietude by assuming a smiling countenance. But soon, overcome by the pain and loss of blood, he requested Duke Lohenberg in French to lead him out of the tumult without being observed, so as to conceal the king's withdrawal from his brave Smolanders he was leading to the charge. Scarcely had they made a few steps when one of the imperial regiments of cuirassiers encountered them, preceded by Lieutenant Colonel Falkenberg, who, recognizing the king, fired a pistol shot, hitting him in the back. Brother, said he to Lohenberg with a dying voice, I have enough. Look to your own life. Falkenberg was immediately slain by the equerry of the Duke of Lohenberg. At the same moment, the king fell from his horse, struck by several more balls, and was dragged some distance by the stirrups. The Duke of Lohenberg fled. Of the king's two orderlies, one lay dead and the other wounded. Of his attendants, only a German page named Lubelfing remained by him. There are differing accounts of the manner of the king's death. But this young man, who died of his wounds at Nomburg five days after the battle, left a statement in his last hours, carefully taken in writing, which best accords with other facts and may be justly considered the most authentic. This account declares that, the king having fallen from his horse, the page jumped from his own and offered it to the dying hero. The king stretched out his hands, but the young man had not sufficient strength to lift him from the ground, when the imperial cuirassiers hastened forward and demanded the name of the wounded personage. The page would not reveal it, but the king himself gave his name, and received immediately on his head a wound which caused his death at once. The body of the king was stripped by the Croats, also that of his faithful page, who was left mortally wounded at the side of his master. Unquote. Despite the death of Gustavus Adolphus, the Swedes would ultimately carry the day at the Battle of Lützen, with their reserve lines coming in to support the front lines and push the imperial troops back. But the loss of the Lion of the North, one of the greatest military leaders in history, would ultimately spell doom for the Swedish cause. The Swedish army would fall back to Bavaria in 1633, then be driven back into Saxony in 1634. That year, at the Battle of Nordlingen, they would suffer a crushing defeat at the hands of von Wallenstein. Swedish troops would remain active in the Thirty Years' War up until it ended in 1648. But from here on out, they are a less important player. Their power has been diminished. In 1635, Saxony and Brandenburg would sign a treaty of peace with Ferdinand II. They would remain faithful imperial subjects, but retain their right to religious freedom. John George of Saxony would also retain his place as elector, a powerful position in the Holy Roman Empire. Albrecht von Wallenstein does not long outlive Gustavus Adolphus. In December of 1633, barely a year after the Battle of Lützen, he is convicted of high treason by a secret court. Ferdinand II offers a bounty on his head, dead or alive, and replaces von Wallenstein as head of the army with his son, who will ultimately become Emperor Ferdinand III. Von Wallenstein tries to flee and actually takes around a hundred of his most trusted men and heads for the Swedish to see if they will buy his services. But on the way, he stops and stays at a house owned by a Scottish mercenary named John Gordon. And unbeknownst to von Wallenstein, Gordon is planning to collect on that bounty. Gordon first invites many of von Wallenstein's men to a party at his mansion. And at the party, he and his co-conspirators murder the officers red-wedding style, 
shooting the last of them in the courtyard as he tries to escape. Later on, one of Gordon's accomplices, an Irishman named Walter Devereaux, breaks down the unguarded door of von Wallenstein's bedroom. The old general wakes up and asks for mercy, but Devereaux runs him through with a spear. And so, in the space of 13 months, the Protestant and Catholic causes in the Thirty Years' War have both lost their greatest leaders. Despite all this, the war would continue. While the Protestants are weakened, many imperial states remain in rebellion, and they're about to get help from yet another outside power. Surprisingly, at least to some, their latest ally is the majority Catholic nation of France. France has her own interests, mostly related to fighting the Spanish. But the French First Minister, Cardinal Richelieu, despises all the Habsburgs and wants to fight them wherever he can. This makes an alliance with the Protestants a necessary move, which is something we'll talk about in the next episode. As for the Swedish, well... Thanks to Gustavus Adolphus, Sweden would rule its European empire for another century, punching far above its weight for a sparsely populated, relatively poor country. They would even briefly own a colony in the New World, a little patch of ground called New Sweden, which modern people know as the city of Philadelphia. Go Eagles! Gustavus's military innovations would also live on. More than 150 years later, a young Napoleon Bonaparte would study Gustavus's army in minute detail, and he would go on to build the French army into the most modern and powerful in the world. But perhaps most importantly, Gustavus Adolphus kept the Protestant members of the Holy Roman Empire in the fight when they had no other allies. Without his intervention, the war would likely have ended in 1629. Instead, the Thirty Years' War would drag on until 1648. This would result in the loss of millions of lives and untold economic losses. But it would also lead to the Treaty of Westphalia, the founding document of our modern nation-state system of international politics. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan. And I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive, the link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description, and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, Not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at 
Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds, as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but uh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.